Chapter four, how to form new habits and delete old ones. To be honest, the scientific evidence I'll present in this chapter might blow your fucking mind. You see, habits are everything. There's tons of academic research on this subject. And what's even more cool is that you see this happening everywhere. Yes, everywhere. I don't want to get technical until later because it's more important for you to understand the motivation behind the subject. To be honest, if you implement and execute fully what is explained in this chapter, you can be on the top of your game. You want to overcome social conditioning? You have to unlearn a habit or two or maybe five. You want to dig deeper into your subconscious mind and get to your inner truth? You will have to remove layers and layers of deep-rooted brain wiring. Let me tell you about my Vipassana meditation retreat and the one lesson I got from it. You see, I have been on a strict plant-based whole foods diet since July 2017. Why? What triggered this? It was 10 days. The very 10 days I spent in Montebello, Quebec doing Vipassana meditation go to www.dhamma.org or dhamma.org for more info. Just imagine this if you've never done it before. You wake up at 4 a.m. every day with a bell. Yes, a ding bell sound. We meditate for roughly 10 to 12 hours daily. Where did this vegan thing come in though? So... At this retreat, they served us vegetarian food. And I thought, fuck it. I'm going to avoid all dairy and just start my veganism veganism during these 10 days. It's crazy, I'm telling you. Me, a guy who had the habit of eating tons and tons of meat, drinking raw organic milk from an underground illegal co-op I used to go to, and four eggs with the yolk every day. Hell, I even made dozens of YouTube videos talking about how meat, eggs, and dairy are essential for testosterone. Yes, essential. Do I still believe that? Fuck no. Yes, I don't want to hurt animals. I feel bad if I ever kill, directly or indirectly, any sentient being. But let me get to this straight. But let me get this straight. I by no means am a vegan due to ethical or sustainability or environmental reasons, even though I know quite a bit about all these subjects. You'll notice that I never really touch upon these in my YouTube videos. I stick strictly to health and fitness and how avoiding meat, dairy, and eggs have helped my energy levels, libido, erections, and strength. It has worked for me in the last five months or so. So, for me, it's solely health. It's what they do to animals in the farms. Knowing this information, I will not dare to eat that shit. However, if I feel that I can eat insect protein because its farming is clean, I will for sure eat it. My goal is health. It's not ethics or the environment or sustainability. I'm just being totally honest even though this will polarize some vegans. I apologize. That's not the point, though. How does a Pakistani meditarian, like me, go from eating four steaks, a dozen chicken fillets, and a few pieces of salmon every week, not to mention four eggs and ricotta cheese and cottage cheese, to having a nutrition regimen without eggs, dairy, or meat? How did Farhan actually unlearn his habit, and adopt a new one. What was that one insight? The insight came during Vipassana meditation in two different ways. The same essence conveyed through two different angles. Let me try to demonstrate it here. In Vipassana, we learned that there is an inner truth. And only by cutting many layers of our consciousness can we get to that deep, buried truth. Let me be honest. That retreat stressed the hell out of me. 
I questioned and doubt and felt reluctance toward everything. I I question and doubt and feel reluctance toward everything I ever do or hear. And this was no different. For the first eight days out of ten, I wanted to get the hell out of there. It was brutal. Why the fuck am I here? I don't need to be around these beta losers who need to go to retreats and be told how to meditate. I have work to get done and these 10 days will waste my time. I need to leave ASAP. I already have a faith and spiritual practice which I've used for meditation since I was a child. Why do I need this other type of meditation? What if this contaminates my mind and soul and I go to the dark side and away from what I've invested in my entire life? So now I want you to sit and write down your top fear. Just one thing that you're scared of in life and that's holding you back. It is keeping you away from obtaining your masculine mind. It could be an addiction or a, dysfun or a dysfunction or something that lowers your self-confidence. Write it down right now. Pause the recording until you are done. Bro, do not take this lightly. Go grab a pen and paper actually write it down that fear of yours and a list of every excuse you can come up with now i assume you've done what i requested now i will tell you the one key to overcoming this fear and overcoming any addiction or dysfunction having a negative impact on your progress the key is this you have habits bad habits the only way you can obtain salvation and thus achieve your goals is to slowly tinker, baby steps, slowly, one by one, instill a new habit to replace the habits which have made you fearful. But there's one way to kickstart your success. Before I give you this next insight, let's talk about Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner, and he's the same dude who Bill Gates says is the smartest person in the world right now. In his book, Poor Charlie's Almanac, spoke about some interesting experiments of the great psychologist Ivan Pavlov. Let me tell you about this dope shit, and it will demonstrate a very unorthodox and extraordinary approach to learning a new habit. For those of you who don't know about the basic experiments of Pavlov, I will explain them now. Ivan Pavlov, who won the Nobel Prize in Psychology, by the way, used to train dogs. What did he do? Imagine you bring Ivan Pavlov, this Russian crazy psychologist who spends all of his time making dogs drool. Imagine you met him. You have some dogs in front of you. Okay, let me start over. I'm sorry. For those of you who don't know about this basic experiments of Av Pavlov, I will explain them now. Blah, blah, blah. Imagine you bring Ivan Pavlov, this Russian crazy psychologist who spends all of his time making dogs drool. Now, you have some dogs in front of you. You first and foremost make them super hungry. So now the fuckers are ready to get their grub on. Then you bring them their food, but at the same time you ring a bell. Ding! What happens? They salivate as they eat the food. They see the food first. They eat it. And they salivate. After a few months of intense training, these dogs begin to associate the bell with the food since he rings the bell each time he brings the food. Guess what happens next? Even when he stops bringing food but rings the bell, they fucking salivate. They have learned AKA their brain's memory system has been wired to automatically through habit drool every time a bell has rang. And guess what? There's nothing conscious about it. These dogs don't even know they're doing it. Just like this. You have one or a few habits which are conditioned, hardwired, brainwashed into your mind's wiring. Due to this, it's difficult for almost or almost impossible to reach a state of the masculine mind. So, what did Charlie Munger teach me? He told me about the other experiments that Pavlov did, did but with chickens, 
when he was in Germany. The experiments, the experiment, the experiment itself was the same: the bell, the food, and the saliva. But he did it with chickens who were inside cages. So what happened? There was a big flood in Germany. A lot of people were injured, some dead. Many rendered homeless. What happened to the chickens, though? Well, they died. Almost all of them. The ones that survived, ah, now we get to the meat of it. No pun intended. You see, the chickens which survived were the ones who were able to keep their beak high enough to not get inundated with the flood, with the water. They were somewhat taller than the rest of the chickens. Aha! And guess what else, son? You remember the brain wiring of habit formation, them salivating with just the bell ringing about, without the presentation of food? Well, it took these chickens six months to learn this perfectly. Yes, chickens learn slow sometimes. That one flood, though, those few hours of devastation, stress, to torture, emotional breakdown, caused the chickens to forget what they learned. Their brain wiring completely transformed to unlearn the behavior. No one really knows about these experiments that pa Pavlov did, by the way. Crazy, eh? So, Charlie Munger believes that it is a massive stressor event which allows one to unlearn bad habits. For me, it was the meditation retreat which turned me into a vegan who actually cares about animals. Those 10 days just like the few hours of flooding for the chickens, rewired my brain. It's nuts. Several of my friends have overcome smoking and alcohol addiction through the retreat. Am I pimping out this retreat to you? Yes. Do, I, do you have to go? No. But just remember, massive change happens from massive action and a bit of foolishness. Haha. -ha. Why do you think those RSD boot camps are full of crazy stressors? They're trying to stress the fuck out of you during those three days of emotional torture and crazy shit that gets you out of your comfort zone so your brain wiring can change and so you can improve and climb towards the masculine mind. How you will do it in your life. Well, it depends on the situation, but let me be very clear. For extraordinary and fast results, you must challenge yourself and do crazy shit. That's just the reality. My porn addiction only decreased when I moved out. When I completely changed my physical environment, my choice architecture. When the US Army left Vietnam, they overcame their heroin addiction. And this is the most addictive drug in the market. The smell, feel, people, objects, everything they were around in Vietnam was not there in the US. Better yet, they had connection from their family and were no longer lonely. Thus, brain wiring. And voila, addiction no more. Brain rewiring and addiction no more. How you will exactly do this for your bad habits, I don't know. But I'm giving you as many clues as I can. The killer instinct and motivation will come from biggest balls in the game. So go on the Facebook group, provide massive value, and receive 10x what you give. Now, I want you to pause for a second, dude. Think about your habits. Let me guess. You sleep on one side of the bed every single day, and you've been doing it for years. But what you don't realize is that when you get up in the morning, you turn to the same side for decades. What do you think happens? There are muscles in your body, such as the external oblique, the lats, and various muscles in, of the core and arms. Pretty much your entire body will be used to getting off your bed. But you know what? One side will be dominant, while the other less strong. You never thought of it this way, did you? What happens in the brain during all this? The synapses, or connections between brain cells, corresponding to that side's muscle groups, become stronger and stronger your neuromuscular connections become stronger and stronger. This is not really of much concern because our bodies are strong 
and therefore can deal with inequalities, imbalances, and one-side dominances. But what if the habit formation is way more deadly? In chapter 2, we covered loneliness, and in the chapter just before this one, we discussed various addictions and dysfunctions. Why do you think these are occurring all the time in the modern man? Just think about it. A kid, which could very well be you, wakes up in the morning, day in and day out, and turns on Facebook, or Instagram, or Snapchat, or some mental stimulation before feeling peace and being mindful of his own being. Studies show that cortisol is highest when we wake up in the morning. Cortisol is the stress hormone released by the adrenal cortex, which is located inside the adrenal gland. If you remember, we discussed the malfunction of the HPA, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, in a previous chapter. Think about it, mate. You wake up in the morning, your cortisol is super high. In fact, the spike in cortisol in the morning is the very reason you wake up from sleep. And then instead of actively seeking peace and tranquility, you stimulate your brain with fake news, virtual reality, and the need of seeking validation from the external environment? Does this sound manly to you? Is this something a masculine mind would execute? You be the judge. There are a number of scientists and technologists who have come forward to talk about the habit formation induced in us by Silicon Valley, porn companies, and the media. It is horrendous. Let's go and first see what each of these leaders are claiming and determine whether we want to hear them out. Dr. Sherry Turkle, MIT professor and clinical psychologist. Sherry has been studying technology for over 30 years, before the invention of the internet. She's been around cutting-edge computer science research and inventions, especially since her late husband, Seymour Papert, was one of the greatest computer science minds ever produced by MIT. She has written several books, and I have read her last two, Alone Together and Reclaiming Conversation. In each of these two books, Sherry highlights the habit we have all formed of texting instead of calling, of being alone rather than in community, and she realizes the importance of conversation and authentic connection. Soon we will get to all the insights regarding how to actually overcome these addictions and reverse bad habits. But before then, let's continue to discuss more facts so you understand the urgency of the situation. We are facing some major dysfunction in societal connection as well. Studies have shown over and over that youth are declining in empathy and understanding of the other. One of the reasons Sherry highlights is that a kid can call another kid ugly or fat using a text message, but never see the facial expression which is the response of this harmful sentiment. Elementary school principals are noticing this especially in the last decade or so. One big difference is, which they observe nowadays is that a kid in elementary school walks up to another kid or other kids and tells her that she is not allowed to play with his group. Just like that. No facial expression. This type of emotionless energy has been felt in elementary schools and junior high schools all over the U.S. and other parts of the Western world. And Sherry gets called in as a consultant to try to resolve such issues. Families are also becoming dysfunctional. What is a father or mother to do? You'll see families sitting at dinner tables, all with their smartphones out. Is it not the father's responsibility to educate his kids on the value of conversation, which builds empathy from eye contact and understanding the pain another human being feels? You may not be a father yet, bro, but keep these thoughts in mind. If you ever become the leader of a family, and your family is dysfunctional, you will suffer. We are noticing more and more detachments in families. We notice an increase in heart attacks, strokes, depression, anxiety, diabetes, mental disorders. The list goes on. High amounts of cortisol released during stressful times has been known to be a major risk factor for these diseases. And if you are in the presence of negative energy and toxic relationships, then it is not long before you develop these major health problems. Let's get a bit into the science of habit formation now, and I will continue to discuss these examples from my personal experiences as well as some insights about other academics who are fighting this with us. Let's co cover some super basic stuff first, shall we? Charles Duhigg wrote in the book The Power of Habit in 2012 that 
it and it became an instant bestseller by the way and it translated into many languages if you have not read this book i highly recommend you read it asap i'll give you the main takeaway of the book here basically a habit is composed of three parts the cue or trigger the routine and the reward let's take porn as an example because it is probably the most prevalent in our generation there are many potential cues for example you were walking around the mall and saw this big titty blonde bombshell coming out of the dressing room with a phenomenal dress on maybe a red one you wanted to masturbate right then and there and pop a load on her face or down her throat you did absolutely nothing of the sort you did not even introduce yourself to her you pushed out and you have been doing this for years in the past years and years in the past nothing has changed there is no improvement now you may ask farhan does my testosterone increase or decrease if i watch porn great question let me address it a bit here since it has come up and by the way i've already addressed this multiple times in the ebook the testosterone blueprint so make sure you reread that section if you're still confused when you get horny and a penile erection begins to form testosterone does indeed increase so if you're watching porn and your erection becomes harder and harder that is correlated with an increase in testosterone this sound this should make perfect sense to you but what about after your ejaculation are you stressed do you feel guilty or ashamed of the masturbation and porn if you do there's an increase in the stress response from your body facilitated by an enhancement in cortical cortisol secretion you see it's not worth it because an increase in cortisol results in a sudden lowering of t levels this is why you will see over and over that guys who are stressed out tend to suffer with low libido loss of sensitivity in their penis and every form of sexual dysfunction imaginable including ed which is erectile dysfunction premature or even delayed ejaculation is this what you call masculine energy is this what we want to have in our masculine minds can a re- can a guy who suffers from these types of sexual disorders ever have ultimate self confidence really think about this as we discuss habits academics have hypothesized that once a trigger the blonde exiting the dressing room results in a routine you masturbating later in the day in your bedroom which gives you a nice reward orgasm ejaculation or simply a temporary relief from the anxiety you have suffered that day at work or school or whatever once these three parts of a habit occur over and over and over the habit becomes wired into your brain your dopamine reward system as we discussed in the previous chapter gets activated from the actual anticipation of the beautiful feeling you will receive upon orgasm the cue can be multifaceted for example the smell of your bedroom or the sound of your computer turning on or your fingers typing something on instagram or you seeing some pictures of a girl on facebook there are millions of triggers and it is very difficult to pinpoint one but you must fucking try so what's the actual solution once you have identified the trigger try to execute a routine that is not masturbation to porn which gives you the same category of reward as ejaculation and orgasm and relief what might those be well it could be yoga dancing sex with a real person lifting at the gym doing cold approach pick up at a club meditation or just taking a peaceful walk alone and breathing deeply into your pelvic floor while you do it you have to find your own routine to replace the bad habit we already discussed some of this protocol in the previous chapter remember i'm repeating it here because i do not want you to take it lightly by any means you must tinker and tinker and try and try and fail and try <laughs> until you figure out the magic solution that helps you and solves your personal issues i'm just here to give you tools mate you just figure out the rest once you overcome your addictions and replace them with good habits your life will change you will transform into the man you are destined to be the man you were before the modern world got a hold of you your quest towards masculinity depends on this work hard on it and don't worry you have the entire community of men with the biggest balls in the game to support you in your journey we already learned about sherry turkle earlier in this chapter 
Now let's stand on the shoulders of more giants. Dr. Adam Alter, Tristan Harris, and Dr. Cal Newport. The stuff I'll discuss next has to do with the very advanced field of choice architecture. You see, human brains are very sensitive, flexible, and malleable to how our physical environment shapes us. So if you're trying to lose weight and overcome the addiction of sugar, but you have sugary snacks in your pantry or in your fridge, no matter how much your willpower, you will fucking give in. That's how the mind plays the game. Therefore, you must understand that a masculine mind is not one that will, that it, it's not the, it, therefore, you must understand that a masculine mind is not one that has the will or power to strengthen or strength to fight and win against cravings when they are staring him in the face. Yes, of course, don't get me wrong. There will be many times when you will have to do this, but that's not the actual game. A masculine mind knows itself, has ample self-awareness to realize the vulnerability and weakness of his own mind, and therefore will design his surroundings to make it easy for him to make the right choice. This, my friend, is choice architecture. Dr. Adam Alter. Adam is a professor of marketing at the New York University School of Business. He's a brilliant mind who wrote the New York Times bestseller, Irresistible. This book is so fucking good. It tells us how irresistible today's technology is. Look at Netflix. At the end of an episode, it will show you a counter. Five, four, three, two, one. And the next episode starts. Then it does this countdown again for the next and the next and the next. Before you know it, you're on the 10th show and you've spent the last five to seven hours binging. So, what can you do? Adam says the following strategy. About five minutes before the end of a show, it, it is the beginning of a cliffhanger. At this time, you will sense that they're about to show you something which will make the next episode irresistible. So, at this point, approximately five minutes before the show ends, you switch it off. And the next day... You start at this moment, watch the next episode again until five minutes left over in that show. And you do this for every show. You will save years of your life. This goes for YouTube, Facebook, and any other platform which auto plays the next video. Just keep in mind, as Tristan Harris tells us, technology companies are trying to maximize attention because that's how they make their coin. So the more attention you pay, the more money they make because of advertisement revenue. Be careful of this because when you use your smartphone, exactly where you put the different more or less addictive apps, how you check your email and when, what do you do with notifications being on or off and on which apps? How do you plan your digital urban city, AKA smartphone, so you get shit done? This is choice architecture for smartphone and technology for us. I am obsessed with this field and will bring you tons of YouTube videos and private Facebook group videos, which is exclusive to our Facebook group and all on this subject in the coming months and years. Let's fucking become badass, more badass, more epic, more sick, more lit, lit as fuck. The last guy I want to talk about is Dr. Cal Newport who wrote the book Deep Work, another fantastic read, man. So Cal basically tells us to get our ass completely off social media. If we want to adapt the good habit of getting serious, deep work done. We may not go this extreme in our approach, but he is a great person to follow. Check out his TED Talk as well. Let's get into more science now. Scientists hypothesize that the reason habits are so important for our survival is because they free up mental bandwidth to allow us to perform the more life-threatening tasks. So, everyday tasks, like driving a car, have now become habits. You'll notice that there is no way that the hundredth time you drove a car is the same exact way as the first time you drove it. The brain learned over time. And now, on a more or less autopilot mode, you drive to school or work or whatever. Your brain has made a habit of driving to that place. Experiments have now localized the part of the brain in which such events 
take place. It is known as the basal ganglia. You do not need to know or remember this name. I'm just telling you here this here because I want you to understand that we have come quite far and can now localize regions of the brain that are involved in behavioral traits and features of a human's everyday life. In 2013, scientists found something interesting concerning the relationship between old and new habits, a finding which extremely is good news for us. They found that the executive and higher areas of the brain are in control of which habit surfaces and carried out practically. You see, the basal ganglia where the habits are being formed is actually a very old area from an evolutionary perspective, whereas the higher level executive areas are fairly new in our evolution as primates. So when you learn a new habit, which is better for your survival and adaptation to your environment, the executive centers of the brain replace the old habit with the new one. However, keep in mind, that those old habits will never be gone. They're just hiding deep underneath. Thus, once you stop practicing and applying the new habit, the old one will come back and continue to haunt you. I remember reading a paper entitled Making Health Habitual, which seriously applies to us. So let me speak about that next. I will give you the big picture takeaway from this. You see, as Dan Kahneman He's an economics professor and Nobel Prize winner, and he wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow. We have two systems, system one and system two. System one corresponds to reflexes, automatic actions we perform without really engaging in cognitive capacities. You may call them habits. System two involves mental manipulation, thinking, planning, debating. What we have found from research is that we need to change habits by working on system one itself. Here's an example. Let's say you want to eat healthy. Well, just eat an apple every time you eat your first meal of the day. Just eat the apple. And if you do this every day, the eating apple habit will age your eating apple habit. Your body will learn this from mechanisms that we still don't fully understand. This could take approximately 66 days, as one famous study showed. In fact, I'm currently working on a choice architecture audio program for you. This is composed of 66 audio recordings. You get a recording every day. After 66 days, you transform into the guy you want to be. It concerns very advanced topic of choice architecture, habits, addictions, technology, goals. It is a badass system, and I hope to bring it to you very soon. It'll be coming out to you in the upcoming months, actually. Stay tuned, mate. Stay tuned, mate. The other trick is to give yourself the ability to do baby steps or climb the ladder one rung at a time. Don't be in a hurry. When you do one good step toward the goal, reward yourself in a healthy and productive manner. So if you go work out, treat yourself to a nice healthy meal at a restaurant or watch a nice movie or go hang out with your friends right after. This way, your brain will learn to associate the workout with extremely positive and enriching behavior. Finally, the paper taught me that you cannot have a habit of not doing something. You can only instill habits of doing something. So in order to erase a bad habit, you can only replace it by another habit. We are learning this more and more as scientists conduct further research in this field. That's it for this chapter. We are done. I know you may have don't have closure and may still be confused about how to overcome every bad habit you have, or you may not be 100% sure how to adopt a new habit. At the end of the day, you got to try something. Trust yourself to learn from error and become smarter. Trust yourself. That's the key. How does trust emerge? It's from gaining ultimate self-confidence the topic of our next and final chapter.